There are some pleasures which are almost impossible to account for and very difficult to describe. I have just experienced one of them while travelling by tube from Paddington to Harrow. Whether I can succeed in making it imaginable to you is doubtful, but certainly my only chance of success depends on impressing you from the outset with the fact that I am what used to be called a country cousin. Except for a short spell in a London hospital during the last war, I have never lived in London. As a result, I not only know it badly, but also I have never learned to regard it as a quite ordinary place. When, on the return from one of my visits, I plunge underground to reach Paddington, I never know whether I shall strike daylight again at the staircase which comes up under the hotel, or at a quite different place out near the end of the departure platforms. All is fortune, so far as I am concerned. I have to be prepared for either event, as I have to be prepared for fog, rain, or sunshine. It was early evening when my journey began. The train was full, but not yet uncomfortably full, of people going home. It is important to insist, you will see why in a moment, that I was under no illusion about them. If anyone had asked me whether I supposed them to be specially good people, or specially happy, or specially clever, I should have replied with a perfectly truthful no. I knew quite well that perhaps not 10% of the homes they were returning to would be free, even for that one night, from ill temper, jealousy, weariness, sorrow, or anxiety. And yet, I could not help it. The clicking of all those garden gates, the opening of all those front doors, the unanalyzable home smell in all those little halls, the hanging up of all those hats, came over my imagination with all the caress of a half-remembered bit of music. There is an extraordinary charm in other people's domesticities. Every lighted house seen from the road is magical. Every pram or lawn mower in someone else's garden all smells or stirs of cookery from the windows of alien kitchens. I intend no cheap sneer at one's own domesticities. But the pleasure is once more the mirror pleasure. The pleasure of seeing as an outside what is to others an inside and realizing that you are doing so. But I need not try to enumerate all the ingredients. The point is that all these things between them built up for me a degree of happiness which I must not try to assess, because if I did, you would think I was exaggerating. But wait, built up is the wrong expression. They did not actually impose this happiness, they offered it. I was free to take it or not as I chose. Like distant music, which you need not listen to unless you wish. Like a delicious faint wind on your face, which you can easily ignore. One was invited to surrender to it, and the odd thing is that something inside me suggested that it would be sensible to refuse the invitation, or was that I would be better employed in remembering that I was going to do a job that I did not greatly enjoy, and that I should have a very tiresome journey back to Oxford. Then, I silenced this inward wisecker. I accepted the invitation, threw myself open to this feathery, impalpable, tingling invitation, the rest of the journey I pass in a state which can be described only as joy. I record all this not because I suppose that my adventure, simply as mine, is of any general interest, but because I fancy that something of the same sort will have happened to most people. Is it not the fact that the actual quality of life as we live it, the weather of the consciousness from moment to moment is either much more loosely or else very much more subtly connected than we commonly suppose with what is often called our real life. There are in fact two lives. In the one come all the things which, if we were eminent people, our biographers would write about, all that we commonly call good and bad fortune and on which we receive congratulations or condolences. But side by side with this, accompanying it all the way like that ghost compartment which we see through the windows of a train at night. There is something else. We can ignore it if we choose, but it constantly offers to come in. Huge pleasures, never quite expressible in words, 
Sometimes, if we are careless, not even acknowledge or remembered, invade us from that quarter. Hence the unreasonable happiness which sometimes surprises a man, at those very hours which ought, according to all objective rules, to have been most miserable. If I am right in thinking that others beside myself experience this occasional and unpredicted offer, this invitation into Eden, I expect to be right also in believing that others know the inner wiseacre, the jailer who forbids acceptance. This jailer has all sorts of tricks. When he finds you not worrying in a situation where worry was possible, he tries to convince you that by beginning to worry you can do something to avert the danger. Nine times out of ten, this turns out on inspection to be bosh. On other days, he becomes very moral. He says it is selfish or complacent of you to be feeling like that. Although at the very moment of his accusation, you may be setting out to render the only service in your power. If he has discovered a certain weak point in you, he will say you are being adolescent, to which I always reply that he is getting terribly middle-aged. But his favourite line in his days is to confuse the issue. He will pretend, if you let him, that the pleasure, say, in other people's domesticities is based on illusion. He will point out to you at great length, evidence never bothers him, that if you went into any one of those houses, you would find every sort of skeleton in every cupboard. But he is only trying to muddle you. The pleasure involves, or need involve, no illusion at all. Distant hills look blue. They still look blue, even after you have discovered that this particular beauty disappears when you approach them. The fact that they look blue 15 miles away is just as much a fact as anything else. If we are to be realists, let us have realism all round. It is a mere brute fact that patches of that boyhood, remembered in one's forties at the bidding of some sudden smell or sound, give one, in the forties, an almost unbearable pleasure. The one is as good a fact as the other. Nothing would induce me to return to the age of fourteen, but neither would anything induce me to forego the exquisite Proustian or Wordsworthian moments in which that part of the past sometimes returns to me. 